in the raw, conversations with creative people. Tonight, I'm excited to introduce you to Diego Mesones. Diego is a filmmaker, a still photographer, and recently started a YouTube channel called Run This Dish. And then there's another version called Run This Drink. So he's teaching us how to make delicious cocktails and food. If this is your first time watching, first of all, thank you so very much. We really appreciate it. I'm your host, Ann Kelly. If we're meeting for the first time, you might be wondering who I am. In a nutshell, I'm someone that's been fascinated with art basically my entire life. About 20 years ago, I made the decision to move to Santa Fe, New Mexico to further immerse myself in the art scene and to attend art school. I've now been working in the professional gallery world for about 15 years now, and about halfway through 2020, I started Art in the Raw to keep the inspiration going. If you'd like to know more, check out the description below. You'll find a few links, including a few interviews with me. But do that later, because I'm excited to introduce you to Diego. Thanks for joining us today, Diego. Thanks for having me tonight. So where are you joining us from? Santa Fe, New Mexico. And you're from Peru originally. Yeah, I was born in Peru and I moved here when I was 22. I'm 38 now and lived in California for most of my time here in the U.S. Well, I was going to say recently moved to Santa Fe, but it's been three years and goes so fast. I can't believe it. But you originally moved to San Francisco. I studied travel and tourism in, in hmm. Peru. And then when I moved here, I thought I was going to continue on that path. So I went for like a travel and tourism program in San Francisco at, at City College. I started working in restaurants because I needed to work and I learned how to bartend. And then later on in 2011 is when I realized that I was really into visual arts, but hmm. filmmaking specifically back then. Photography was part of your motivation for moving to Santa Fe? I had lived in, in Los Angeles for a year, so I knew I didn't want to go back to LA to pursue filmmaking, and then I knew New Mexico was a, a good opportunity, so, so I moved here. At that time, when I moved here, I was also getting really into still photography. Still photography and film is pretty connected. They go by hand, hand by hand. When I first started studying filmmaking, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to be, you know? There's so many things you can do in filmmaking. Almost everybody goes into filmmaking thinking, I'm gonna be a film director, you know, and be famous. Like, and you know, uh, it's, it's, it's fun. It's a lot of fun. And, and you know, like you have this sense of power and you know, you get your idea out um, in the, on, on the screen and all. But I actually got really into cinematography. I, I thought like, oh my God, you know, how, how the set is, is lit, you know, and, and the camera angles and all that kind of stuff really got me. And I thought like, you know, I think I want to be a cinematographer. It, it really appeals to me. Even when I was back in film school, you know, when we had the, the assignments, you know, I always wanted to be behind the camera and lighting the scene and all that stuff. And without knowing back then, it's kind of like, okay, maybe I'm a photographer inside. I think that led me into photography, you know, just wanting to be a cinematographer in, in filmmaking. In San Francisco and arriving in Santa Fe, bartending was a good kind of day-to-day -day profession. And in, in the course of that, you became really skilled in, in the art of making cocktails. Out of necessity in, in San Francisco, I, you know, I started in restaurants and again like I was saying in filmmaking it's like you pick what you want to be in the restaurant you know and I got like fascinated by 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 being behind the bar and like having people like you know one-on-one -on -one, getting that connection right and then I, I started learning first just like bartending like simple right but with the years I discovered this like this art in 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 making a cocktail, right? And got into mixology and 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 you know just got bigger and bigger and I started working in like better restaurants, you know, more like uh, upscale fine dining and and you know the skills started like to 
to get better and better. And so I came to Santa Fe with that. Uh I thought, okay, I can offer that to a good place in Santa Fe. So I found, well, it was one restaurant first. I'm not going to say the name, but then that, that then I found this really cool place on Radish and Rye. I felt like I could really develop my skills there, you know, and it was a great team and they had a great, great craft whiskey, speci- specialized in whiskey, uh, American whiskey, bourbon and rye. So it was, it was a great experience. I really enjoyed it. I, I miss it sometimes, but at the same time, well, you know, so with COVID and everything, now I get to make the cocktails here at home. Right. Within the pandemic decided you were going to start concentrating on other things. But as part of that, you recently started a YouTube channel that's focused on cooking and, and making cocktails. There's run this dish and then also run this drink. With the pandemic and like not being able to go out to eat, I was just cooking a lot. Uh, my, my brother recently moved to Canada and he, he does not know how to cook at all. And so he asked me like, how do you make this? How do you make that? So I was just like, you know, texting him. And and one one day I was like, you know what? Like, let's let's get on the video. I'll show you how to make it. And you know, it turned out really good. You know, not like the YouTube channel. It was out of my phone. You know, he just watched me like, and then he's like, you know, hey, why don't you just like start like uploading these recipes on a YouTube channel? I'm like, yeah, no. But you know what? One day I was like months later, it's like, you know what, I'm 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 kind of bored and I need to get some of these cameras, this equipment out of the closet, get the dust out and just also that I don't get rusty so I can like try to make a good video and at the same time I can cook some good recipes, Peruvian, could be American, Italian, uh, recipes from from when I was a a kid growing up in Peru that I learned uh, or things that I've seen in restaurants that I've worked before. I, I worked in a, a couple of Italian restaurants and there are great recipes there. So it's like, you know what, I'm going to make a, I'm going to try to make it simple so people can just like follow the recipe and do it at home for fun. You know, I thought this is going to be for friends, family, but you know, if it's shared and other people can get something out of it, great. And then I was like, you know, I can also make drinks. I, I Recently uploaded the first cocktail in the in the channel, which is a Manhattan. Got like a lot of messages, like, "Oh my God, this is great!" You know, <laughs> so it's fun. My intention is not to monetize with the channel, but to have fun and share. In the end, art in any way, it's about sharing. It's not about ego or monetizing. And in this case, at least, you know, it's not my intention. It's also just a great opportunity to, like you said, break, break out the cameras and um, exercise those muscles and to be able to share your skills with other people. Usually it's the cases where people are just doing things because for the reasons that you've described that they actually do end up becoming successful. I think success in, in, in that matter, a number of people that I haven't talked to in so long like years that have sent me a message saying like I made your pesto or I made your Manhattan you know it's great and that I mean that's like oh you made my day you know that's that's great how did it turn out great you know perfect um so yeah I, I measured success by someone did my recipe okay you know that's great mm-hmm. I, I mean I don't care about the likes or all the views or anything and like you say you know I, I it's like mixing two things, you know, I, I get to use my cameras again and my lighting setup and my audio. And also, I mean, the editing process, it's intense. Making a dish sometimes could take an hour. So if it takes an hour with the video, it takes two hours. And then the editing process is another four or five hours. I think I'm a little rusty in that. I used to edit a lot faster than that, but because I'm, I'm also doing subtitles, it's in Spanish for the food and in English for drinks. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm doing subtitles on both, you know? <laughs> so. Right. Well, and you also do a good job of distilling down that hour's worth of cooking into usually a, say, 10 minute episode or something like that. And- yeah, I, I want to make it short. I believe the first one was 10 minutes and 
and then I thought like I can actually make it even shorter and being precise on on what I want to say so I've been doing four five six minutes and that's like my my range right now I think shorter is actually harder or in my experience anyways <laughs> yeah no making it shorter it's challenging in an editor it's just like a, being a magician I've seen it working in film and working in television as well uh Sometimes I will be handed like a an hour uh, piece of footage, and they would like the producer would be like, "I want this down to two minutes." Oh my god! How? <laughs> but you have to do magic, and then you ended up doing it in two minutes, you know, and and you know it has to make sense and everything. So it's a like good oh practice. Wow, that's that's impressive. So. You, you mentioned you recently aired the first episode of Run This Drink, and it was a Manhattan. Yeah. And tonight on Art in the Raw, you're going to teach us how to make another whiskey-based cocktail. Correct. So should we, uh, we jump in and, and make that? Yes. So for tonight, we have a Boulevard Gear, and I always struggle pronouncing that, <laughs> but that's the name of the drink. So this consists on whiskey, bourbon, or rye. It's your preference. I like rye myself. Campari and sweet vermouth. It's a Negroni with whiskey. Negroni is with gin, full of ideas with, uh, with, with American whiskey. The drink we're making tonight is kind of similar to a Manhattan. It seems like um, other than the, the Campari yeah. is a major difference. And you said it was more of a rocks drink than a. You can, yeah, it's usually, I usually drink it on, on the rocks, but it could be served up. And the difference here is you have Campari and in Manhattan you have bitters. And the measurements different as well. So we're going to take our jigger. So you're going to take your rye whiskey. So you're going to go all the way to the top and then put this into your mixing glass. So, you, so one ounce of rye whiskey or bourbon, for those who like bourbon a little better. And one ounce of Campari, which is an Italian aperitif made out of herbs. Very aromatic, very herbal. And then one ounce of sweet vermouth. So one ounce, one ounce, and one ounce. Then you're gonna add the ice. And then you're gonna stir it. With your bar spoon. If you don't have a bar spoon, you can use any kind of spoon. It's gonna be easier. Origin of the bar spoon. Do you know that story? No, I don't think so. I don't either. Let me know that you have the spoon on this side and you have also, you have this other end that you can also use. Mm -hmm. So you can use both, both sides, but I don't know the story of the bar spoon. It's long because you, you want to get the handle of, of getting the, the alcohol, your spirits all mixed together. Anyway, once you have it all mixed in your glass, you're going to take your glass with a, with a piece of ice. I have a sphere tonight. And I do too. Okay, great. Yeah, all right. I usually use uh, a big cube, but tonight I feel like I want a sphere. And hey, you have a sphere as well. So. Apparently, we were just both feeling the, the spheres. Collective consciousness. So now you, you're you just going to take an orange. You're going to peel a little bit of the orange. I don't have an orange tonight. So you can do a cherry. It's valid. It's OK. But if you want to know the classic ways with an orange peel. Would you light the orange peel on fire if you had one? It's just for fun, really. It doesn't uh, well, actually, it does. Um, if you if you 
If you add the uh, little fire on the twist, where you bend the orange twist and you light it with a, with a, with a lighter, it's gonna change the, the flavor, I'll tell you. So I don't usually do it. I, I prefer it like just bend it and you get the oils from the, from the citrus, from the, from the peel. And that's gonna give, give a really nice aromatic profile to the cocktail. So you get the first thing you do when you put your, when you're about to drink it, you, you first, you always, you always gonna smell it first. You're gonna get that orange, the citrusy twist on the drink. And then you just salute. All right, well. That is good. Good, isn't it? Yeah. 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 As you know, I'm a Manhattan fan and I I don't think I've ever had one of these. Yeah. Manhattan's probably my favorite classic cocktail. It's the Sounds of the City series. Mm -hmm. I started that back in 2017 and this was months away from, from moving to Santa Fe. I have two two short films on uh, people that I found on the streets who have great talents in music. And music is one of my biggest passions as well. I'm, I'm an amateur musician, play the conga drums. It's one of those things like I went out and saw someone playing and like, oh my gosh, that sounds so amazing. What a delicious sound. And can I film you? I don't want to put like an end to it. I think, I, I feel like I want to keep doing it as I found people, mm -hmm. talented people who, not necessarily that I found on the streets, but it could be people that I know that are like really good musicians that have played like an instrument and be like, hey, you know, like you're, you're from Santa Fe. Okay, let's, let's go somewhere nice in Santa Fe, play your instrument, just be yourself and I'll, I'll just capture you uh, doing your, your art. And yeah, that's the idea. Um, I did two only. One of them is my, my, my cousin's husband playing the guitar. He plays the Andean guitar or actually Andean music in the guitar. And then the second person played the handpan, amazing instrument that is not easy to see on the street, you know, but he was playing in the park. I just approached him. So then the idea was to keep going. And as I go to different places, then try to find people. I haven't done it in Santa Fe yet. At some point, I want to go back to it. I, it it's been on hold for, for a few years now, but it's, it's a thing that I want to keep doing. Like a photography series. You, you, sometimes you take a long break and you go back. So in terms of the person you filmed in the park that you didn't know, did you just happen to have professional gear on you? Or I mean, I went out so many times and came back home with nothing. And mm -hmm. that one day, and, you know, it was, it was great because it was a typical San Francisco a late afternoon. It was very cloudy. It was gloomy. And the guy was playing in the park. He was teaching the handpan to a, to a student. And I just, yeah, I, I was carrying my, my things, camera and audio equipment. So you were, you were searching for something like that. And yeah, I was searching. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really amazing instrument. I don't know that I've seen it or, or heard it before. I honestly heard it that time for the first time in my life. And, and I thought it, was, it blew my mind. It sounds almost similar to other instruments I've heard, but not exactly. It's, 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 very, it's a very unique sound. Well, I, I have another project. When I was in Peru the last time I... I went to a cemetery that, you know, brings me a lot of memories from my childhood. My grandfather is buried there. One of those things that you go, you go there after almost 20 years and, you know, all the memories come back to you when you were a kid. And this cemetery is just so different from what you would imagine in the United States. This cemetery is called El Angel in, in Lima, in Peru. And I just went there once um, out of curiosity and I was all, always carrying my camera. So I, I started shooting there. I, I shot the first day and then I thought I have to come back for more. This is a very early stage, although it's on my website, I want to keep going. You, you see interesting things there.
the workers in that place, they have amazing stories to tell, you know, especially old people that have worked there for 30, 40 years in that cemetery. And you just stop and talk to them and they tell you stories, even like they tell you about ghosts and stuff. It's very challenging, I'll tell you, because I'm never scared of approaching people and ask for a portrait, but in, in, in a cemetery it's different. It, it's delicate, you know, it's one of those things that you have to find the right moment and kind of read the situation. I mean, like maybe it could be someone that's been dead for a long time and just, have, you know, approach and have a conversation and explain your project and they, they might let you take a photo, you know. I saw this, uh, I think it was brother and sister and they had, they were in front of the niche with flowers and they had a big case of beer and they had like a radio and music and they would drink and they were drunk. I mean, they were really drunk and like talking to the dad who was dead. You know, I believe I have a photo that I took from far away, but you know, that's one of those things, you know, like I want to like approach and like know a little bit more about you and, and, and then the cemetery itself tells a story, you know, it tells a very nostalgic story for so many people. For me, for instance, you know, I, I went to see my grandfather after, oh gosh, like 25 years or so. Finally found it. The cemetery is huge. And it's like a labyrinth, you know, it's just so crazy. And I finally found it. I got, I got him flowers. I took a photo of his niche and it just came out black. The only photo of my whole thing just came out black. I don't know why, it's weird. I didn't, didn't do anything wrong. I'm pretty sure there was no reason why it came completely unexposed, but. Maybe because you're supposed to go back. Maybe, yeah. You know, there's so many things that I've been thinking about that, but again, like the sounds of the city thing, I want to take my time next time to when I go to Peru, like a very old cemetery. There's this cemetery and then you have the main road and then you have another cemetery that's older, 1700s and 1800s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then they, they built this other one in Gaza because it got really full. It's very different. Parts of the cemetery that are very creepy. You'll find places that are big mausoleums of like rich people mm -hmm. where, you know, you know, marble and like you go in, well, Fam, like family members can go in and it's all like beautiful filled with flowers and they bury the whole family in the mausoleum and then you get the like regular people those who are not forgotten like they still get flowers but they have a nice niche you know and then you have the do you have the forgotten people who have no resources to get a niche and then you have like a black writing on on it on concrete and then you have the, those who didn't have that, they're like empty holes and it's, there's not even grass around, it's all like, and you'll find some that are like question marks. They literally write question marks on it, like unknown. So there's like a mix of everything. You can see a society buried there, the social classes, and it's, it's, it's super interesting. I know you can't, you can't, probably can't really show images from it, but, but there was a documentary project that you were working on in the past few years. I don't know if you can really talk about it at all. I can, I have permission okay, cool. to talk about it. And also um, I have permission for anybody who's interested. I can provide the uh, link and password to it because it's a private video, but if cool. someone's interested, definitely. This is a, a project that I was hired for from a nonprofit here in Santa Fe or in New Mexico. They're located in Santa Fe, Taos, Española. And the project is called Santuario del Corazón. We went, to, we went down to uh, El Paso, Texas and border city uh, Juarez to provide for mental and basically support for immigrant families down in the border when the border crisis was in its 
very, very difficult time back in uh, 2019. This organization would go and through art therapy, make the, the children, the immigrant children from Central America and Mexico who were in a shelter in Juarez, Ciudad Juarez, given a, a very nice time with art therapy and games and um, also some, some, some help for the adults, the parents, like some support, you know, because they struggle a lot. Also the organization did its part on the other side on, uh, in El Paso with other organizations down there that get into the, you know, how the immigrant families, when they cross to the United States and their trials and like all that kind of stuff, not expert on the subject, but you know, I, I, I really had a, um, an amazing experience there just filming and, and photographing these, these, these immigrants, you know. Um, I'm an immigrant myself, but I, I, I was lucky enough to come on a, on a visa at the time and now just to be a citizen. But these people, it's just a completely different story. You know, we still have some empathy and like, okay, this could have been me. Documentary is for like an hour and it's divided in five parts. So like explanation of what the shelters do in Juarez and what do they provide to the immigrant families. Then there's like a part of the actual children doing art. You have to see the documentary to, to really, I, I cannot go into it too much as well for confidential reasons, but um, it was also during a, uh, the mass shooting in El Paso, Texas in a Walmart that happened around there. So there's also a section that's dedicated to that. A lot of people who were in that shoot, who died or were in that shooting and didn't die, crossed, you know, from, from Juarez to El Paso. There's a lot of people who work, they live in Juarez and work in El Paso and just go shopping and, or, or work in El Paso and then go back to Juarez. So there's a, a section of the, the documentary that's dedicated to that. And there's also a part where like, you know, we decided that we wanted to show the, how these two cities are bonded, you know, and, and the culture that was created in El Paso that has so much in common with Juarez, but then there's like diff completely different reality in the, in the other side of the border. So um, it's, 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 it's a beautiful piece, I, I got to say, and it really touched me. It got to be one of my most meaningful uh, projects that I've ever done. And you took three or four trips? Seven or eight. Seven or eight. Okay. Okay. So, I mean, mm -hmm. you took quite a few trips. And how long were you there each trip? We'll go for five days. Go one or two days to Juarez, to the shelters. And then the other days in El Paso, like the organization would do their, their things there. I mean, that was a, an important, but rewarding, but, but also kind of difficult project, I would imagine. Yeah, it wasn't easy. You know, you have to, sometimes you have to detach yourself from, from some things. You know, I don't, I don't know if I ever mentioned this to you, but sometimes I will be there and then Three, four days later, I'll be back in Santa Fe, working at my bar, getting people drunk. And like, you know, it was such a shocking reality. Right. That, you know, it, it, it got me a few times, you know, I, I had to learn how to deal with that and not just get it under my skin because it's not healthy. I mean, you have to, you know, just keep it in your in your senses and be like, I'm doing a job and yeah, you can have empathy and you can mm -hmm. give all the support you can. Cause sometimes I will have to put my camera down and play with the kids as well. You know, right. so much from, from you. I mean, they, they see you and you know, they obviously know you're not one of them. They, they know you're, you're coming from the other side of the, the border. Right. Uh, but and I, and I want to say this, not all of the, the documentary is negative. Like, in fact, 
we wanted to give like a very positive approach. There is a section in the video where we, we went to Ciudad Juarez, we went into a plaza and we saw this amazing people dancing American music, like rock and roll from the, from the 60s, you know, or 70s. And yeah. they, they're just dancing with like their costumes and the hats and, you know, and they're just dancing and having a great time. It's not all bad on the other side, as people right. think. So we wanted to pro portray that as well in, in the video. That's, that's an important part of the story as well. You could have definitely portrayed it in different ways. Do, do you think you would do other projects like that in the future? I'm open to it. Mm -hmm. if, if the opportunity comes, I'm, I'm very open to it. If you ask me what's your main interest, if you were going to do photography, I would pick documentary photography, but like visual arts in general, you know, like, you know, video to, to me is what like comes out of my my pores, you know, my skin, you know, it's like what drives me right away. And I don't want to put photography second, you know, they go by hand by hand, the things that you like, this, this, this gotta be on video, or this gotta be, you know, and, and, you know, this gotta be a portrait. So, sure. or sometimes you can combine them too, you know, that's one of the things that I like to do. I like combining things. I want to like, I, I like doing hybrid kind of like work experience and but documentary definitely like appeals me. Work with people in need, like for sure. So if the opportunity comes, I'll take it. And I, I wouldn't think it twice. One of the amazing things about visual arts is just being able to maybe tell a story that's kind of hard potentially, but to film it in, in a beautiful way that's been done over the years where, where difficult subjects have been recorded in a visual way to encourage people to take notice because then right. you see this image and the way it's captured sucks you in. It's, it's a powerful tool. It is. And, and, and one, one of the things that I've learned along the way is that you have to, you have to say something. You have to say something with your work, but you have to be ambiguous. You know, you cannot take a side or just like nail into something. So like you are like, hey, look, look how these people are so poor and like how they suffer. No, no, that's that's not art. No. But you, you definitely want to tell something, I think. You know, you just want to tell a story. Filmmaking is storytelling most of the times. You know, there was a time where I, I mean, when I started in filmmaking, I was doing experimental film, mm -hmm. you know, like you don't necessarily want to say anything. Sometimes people just want to be like, hey, look at my crazy abstract thing, you know, take some mushrooms and like enjoy. <laughs> like, I don't know. As, as you go, you, you start like opening different doors, right? And, and, and finding really, really great, great things on the way and then like you're like okay I can use my skills to say something either it's is real in documentary or like if it's fiction and narrative you know as well sure that's that's a that's a realm I have not yet touched but I would love to some sometime in the future in narrative filmmaking I'm not a good writer I've tried but it I wish could I happen yeah, I mean, you have to like polish your skills. You, you said you like a challenge. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I'm still waiting for the person who's like, hey, I have a script, you know, <laughs> let's shoot so it. At the beginning of our conversation, you had mentioned when you first arrived in San Francisco, had other intentions and, and film just kind of, so what is that story? When, when I was finishing high school uh, in Peru, they will come to you and be like, hey, what do you, what do you want to be? What do you want to study, right? And most people, I, mean, I, I don't know if most people, but a lot of people, they knew what they wanted to do. Like they, they came in the, in the last year of high school knowing like I'm going to college to do this, right? I, I had no idea. I had no idea because I was told since very early in, 
in, in when I was a kid that I sucked at art. Mm. I remember a a um, a teacher who 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 actually told me that to my face when I was I don't know I was twelve. You know, um, it was like sculpture and, and and drawing and you know painting, and I mean I I thought she was like a witch, you know, and really mean person. So maybe she didn't really I might motivate, agree. motivated me to get into it. But anyway, she told she told to my face like you you suck at this. You better like try something else for your future. But you're not an artist. And she told me that. And, and, and I, you know, I thought, I mean, that stayed with me. The problem is that I believed her. I believed her. So by, by the end of high school, like I did not know what I wanted to be. And the only thing I knew back then was that I liked traveling. I love traveling. I was already traveling when I was six, 15, 16 years old. I was traveling all over Peru. So I knew I liked traveling. What I knew but I didn't know at the same time is that since I was a kid since I was seven or eight years old I was always with a camera on my hand always recording like baptisms like family reunions later on when I was a teenager going to my friends on a little trip I would have my camcorder or have like a point and shoot I was always documenting always documenting like parties and I didn't know that, like I, I had that, but I didn't know it. So when, when, I, when I, it was time to decide what I was gonna do with my life, because I like traveling, I decided to go to hospitality, travel and tourism. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I spent all this four or five years studying that. So I had to wait until I was 28 years old and I'm going back to my friend here. He was going to the Academy of Arts in San Francisco for fine arts photography. So at the very beginning, I was his model for his assignments. And I did that for a long time for him. And then by the end of his uh, studies, he, had, he's, he did his first photography series in the city of Richmond, California. Mm -hmm. And I would go with him. A lot of times, sometimes he went by, me, by himself, but I, a lot of times I went with him. And, and when I was with him, I remember I had this little Canon point and shoot, you know, very simple camera. And I thought I, as he was like doing his work and like taking photos in the city, I thought like, I wanna take photos of him taking photos. Mm -hmm. So I started doing that. And then I didn't tell him. I, I, I was like, I'm, this is going to be a surprise. You know? <laughs> so I was taking photos of him taking photos. But, you know, as the project was evolving, we, we were seeing like crazy things there. Um, really, really interesting things that I was like, okay, this cannot be just in photo. I have to record this, you know. So I would like record, I take little clips on this like cheap, simple camera, little, little clips. And, <laughs> and yeah, it was just funny how like that started to be a thing for me, like taking videos, documenting him and the situations happening. I accumulated a hundred clips and I finally put them together I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know anything about filmmaking. So I wanted to edit. So I was like, I'm going to go to iMovie and learn how to edit. And so I put this thing together and I gave it to him. And that, that I can say is my first short film. It's very amateur. It's very rustic. But I still keep it in my portfolio. Like when I, when, if you see my Vimeo profile, Mm -hmm. that's that's still gonna be there that's always gonna be there because that every time I see it it reminds me of how I started what got me dr driven to filmmaking every time I see it's like always think have that fire in you don't give up 
So that's why I keep it. That's that's basically the story how it started. He saw it and he was like, "Hey, man, this is really good. You know, this comes from your from your heart and and it has a lot of potential. Why don't you just like sign up for for film school at City College?" And I did. Like I, I I started learning technique. The rest is just history. Well, that's that's great, and I also think it's just crazy, just the whole idea of anybody expecting anybody to come out of high school knowing exactly what what they want to do like you said everybody knew what they wanted to do but you know i i bet a lot of them were just faking it uh it's it's, it's how it is and so in in terms of of other films do you have a few favorite movies or directors i i know some smaller filmmakers i can reference one person who has like really influenced my work is this French filmmaker, Vincent Moon. I actually got in touch with him and just by watching his films, I learned a lot. And just by talking to him as well, gave me a lot of good advice. He has a very unique technique. He's, again, his name is Vincent Moon. Look it up, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna fly. My favorite directors are Kubrick, Woody Allen, who I made a cocktail to once. Oh, nice. Yeah. What did he drink? Do you remember? He had a martini, just a vodka martini. Oh, Martin Scorsese, of course. Those three are directors that to me are to follow, you know, just follow them and you're gonna like keep, you're gonna keep filmmaking alive. I like Quentin Tarantino a lot, but I like him, I like him a lot more as a screenwriter, more than a director. I, he's an, Terrific director, don't get me wrong, but I think his his writing is superb. It's, it's just amazing. Speaking of Tarantino, I think Tarantino would not be the same without his cinematographer. His cinematographer, his director of photography, Robert Richardson, he's a compliment. Tarantino would not be the same without him. He's still great, but he makes a difference. You know, he he, he adds that plus to it. And I, like I said early on, I really, when I, when I watch a film, the first thing that gets me is the cinematography, the lighting, the mood, the texture. If, if it's shot in film, even better. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not against digital, but I mean. Well, and you, and you don't really see as much of that anymore. Yeah, it's rare. Films actually being shot with film which sounds weird but but it is rare and it's something i don't think people think about as much like uh digital versus analog photography is a little more kind of in the forefront but when you go to it's rare when you go to the movie theater or watch a film people say oh this is a this is shot with so and so i'd say the the general consumer doesn't really think about that oh of course and when it comes to photography i prefer shooting for uh, film Mm-hmm. That's my preference, but that's for my personal work. Right. I can do digital, sure, but you, I think there's a place for each kind of photography. I think I I, I did corporate headshots last year for for an organization. I'll be, of course, I'm gonna shoot digital. I'm not gonna shoot film for that, you know. But right. when it comes to my my personal work, yeah, I'm gonna go with film. So. I'm not one of those who's like, film is better than digital. I think that's, you know, it's, you decide what you like best, what what's best for you, and that's it. But when it comes to motion film, yes, I am always gonna be like, film is much better. And I don't know why filmmakers with big budgets are not doing it more. Right. Because it's, I, I would hate that that disappears. I have a 60 millimeter camera and I have film in the fridge, but it's so expensive to, to shoot one can of film. It's like two, two and a half minute, two and a half minutes only. And it's super expensive to, to, to process and you have to digitalize it later. You know, it's, it's, it's a whole process. So, you no, know, I think big, big, big productions should, should still shoot in film. It's such a different feeling, you know? Would they put that in the credits? At the very end, you'll see uh, this was shot in Panavision, 35 millimeter or 70 millimeter film. 
you'll, right. you'll see that. And, and, and it's one of those things I, I got like a better with time, you know, to just see like, okay, that this is shot in film. And then I confirm it at the very end of the credits when I see that Panavision 35 millimeter, 70 millimeter film. I was like, oh, I was right. And what a lot of people do now is also try to uh, simulate film with digital. And that's, that's a good practice. It's not the same though. It's never gonna be the same. Like with filters or like that type of thing? Like how so? There, there, there are a few ways you can do that. Filters is one way and also playing with your ISO. You know, ISO is if you bring it up, you're gonna give more noise. Right. Although, you know, noise looks bad as opposed to grain. But if you do it right, if you don't overdo it, I had this camera, it was like a Nikon camera, digital. And I, for a whole year, I was like really trying to get that look. And of course, it's not going to look like film, but it gets close. Mm -hmm. And I got it. And I got it. And I nailed it. And it, it looked great. You know, it's... You have to play with your with your ISO and your shutter speed, pretty much. You see my uh, Run This Dish series, you will find some shots, some close-ups that simulate that a little bit. You, you'll feel it has a different texture because that when I do the close-ups, I, I use that camcorder as opposed to the rest of the shots that I use uh, 4K camera. Well, I know I've talked to still photographers that get annoyed with you know, maybe they shot a specific Polaroid film and then all of a sudden Instagram or whatever has some new app where you can just like add the border. And sometimes it works, sometimes it's just kind of cheesy, but that's kind of- uh, Instagram thing. is tricky. Yeah. It's, Instagram is tricky, really. I don't know, I have, I'm on the, right on the edge of like, I don't know where to go with that, but I post on Instagram, but I don't want to put my best on Instagram. Mm -hmm. I put like, what's okay. Cause when you work, when you have photos, you'd be like, do I put this on my website? No, this is not website material. I don't want this to be in my portfolio. I don't want people to hire me because of this, but this is like a good enough photo to go on Instagram. It's like nice, you know? So I have my, um, my Instagram, uh, I call it the backyard. You know, I sent I sent all that stuff to the backyard, and you know it's it's just like that. But I don't want to. I I I know there are photographers who based their work, their art, on Instagram. Personally, I think that's the wrong route. Although, for some of them, it works. But I don't know. I think there are other ways. People are forgetting about scenes or photo books. You know, that's more like tangible and like promote that you know it's like we're becoming so digital these days with everything okay. music for instance yeah I cannot listen to mp3s anymore I can't I like my old good vinyl record and my good sound system where I can actually listen to details mm -hmm. it's like listening to the album for the first time so I'm, a good album that you like you put it on a record oh my gosh I never heard, listened to this song before. It's a whole different experience. Right, and you've been collecting records. Yeah. Recently, right? Um, over a hundred, and it's like one of my favorite new hobbies, mm -hmm. but it's dangerous, <laughs> like it costs money. You know? mm -hmm. But sometimes you cannot stop. It's like, oh, they, they, there's a very good, uh, for those who live in Santa Fe, there's this, really amazing record store called the guy in the groove on guadalupe mm -hmm. yeah. right across bumblebees they have really amazing records and for a really good price i have to say you have you can find first press second press records for like 13 dollars you know and then you look up online and they're, they're like 60 bucks 30 dollars 60 dollars wow but yeah, that's my new favorite hobby. I, I really enjoy it. So in terms of recent records you've added to your collection, do you have favorite new records in the collection? Yeah, so um, <laughs> one of the things when, when I went to San Francisco a couple of weeks ago, I went to 
my favorite record store that used to be around the corner from where I used to live in San Francisco on Hate Street, Amoeba Music. I had that store like two blocks away and I had to like travel all the way there to go back. Um, so yeah, we went there, my friend and I, who also collects records and we just had our little tour in Amoeba Music and we picked a few records. Um, so let's see, I got Bell and Sebastian. I got the Carpenters, I got Interpol, Arcade Fire, a record from Miles Davis. You, you are going for it, you are shopping. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, definitely. And, and, and that was just in Amoeba Music. Um, mm -hmm. We also went to a few more record stores in, uh, in San Jose, where he lives, and I got more records there. I had a carry-on, just for records. <laughs> So I brought 10 records with me so we can listen at his house. And then I came back with another 10 records. To Santa Fe, I went back to the record store. I got a Johnny Mitchell record. I got a George Michael record. I got The Verb. I don't know. Some people don't know them. They're from Australia. The Bittersweet Symphony, 1998. One of the first cassette tapes I ever owned was George Michael. Which one? Whatever one was popular in 1980, probably six. Uh, I got a record from Beck. Mm -hmm. Oh, Beck, that sounds, that record sounds amazing. Really, really amazing. Actually, I do have some of my records like right there. Um, oh, nice. Um, they're my printer. The other ones are in the, in the living room with the, um, with a record player, but I don't have any more space. So, I just put like records on this little shelf and I have them like 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Nice. And the um, so, you know, the rest of the records, like the good records are on, in the living room. Yeah, I have them well organized alphabetically and all. Like, I'm, I'm a little crazy about that. I wash my records. Well, you want to you wanna take good care of things. But you yeah. Know. Yeah, these are things that are meant to last. So, so you got to go to San Francisco recently, as we had talked about. Are there any other places that you're aspiring to go to? Well, I'm going on a road trip in um, three weeks. Cool. Where are you going? Indiana. Stacy's my girlfriend, is from Indiana. Her, her dad is turning 80. And wow. so we're, we want to spend some time with them. We haven't seen them in two years. And so it's going to be really, really exciting to go see them again and spend some time with them. So far, I'm taking two cameras, maybe three. I don't know. But I'm, I'm, I'm packing like, um, like 10 to 12 rolls of film. <laughs> well, medium format, 12 per, per roll, not too crazy. That part of the country, I've never been like through... Uh, the, the the center, right? I know all the West Coast. I've been through all the West Coast, but I've never driven through the middle, the, the center. So that's going to be exciting. If money was not a thing and you could just go anywhere, anywhere you want. Well, if, I, if I'm going to go with Stacy, she hasn't been to Peru yet. I'd love to go to Peru with her first cousin is my travel buddy you know? so if either if it's with my, my cousin Morocco and you know Egypt northern Africa I think it's like on my radar what is it about those places that culture really um, attracts me a lot because it's it's Africa but it's not the Africa that you would think right away pyramids and camels and like Mm -hmm. sand I, I don't know I, I I picture that that not northern Africa with like red and yellow and brown colors and it's just in my mind I think it's a culture that I really want to explore mm -hmm. just like like middle eastern culture I, I really want to explore at some point I, th I, I don't know I think that's my next thing on my bucket list so here here's one of my new favorite questions time travel time travel if you could time travel to a certain era 
place. And obviously this doesn't involve money and it could be anything you want. So it could be like one of the places you mentioned, but a certain time. I, I had this conversation with a friend not, mm -hmm. not too long ago. And he said like, where would you like to go? You know, the same question, right? And I said like, well, I would like to go to like the, uh, you know, like the Jesus Christ time. Mm -hmm. I would like to be in the Incas time in mm -hmm. South America. I'd like to be in the middle age and, you know, and so on, but I, I will always tell him like, I would like to go there, but like have a, like a capsule that nothing happens to me. Mm, <laughs> like right. I could just watch, but nothing happens to me. Because right. I want to see, I would love to see the middle age. I would love to go to the, you know, the castles and see like the, the, the kings, uh, the queens and like how all that, you know, society worked back then. But if you said something wrong, you would be burned alive, right? Or like beheaded. <laughs> but I would like, I would love to see that, but like having like a, a capsule. So, so you want to go there through like VR or something? Uh, right, something. But if, if <laughs> but, but, but to be, that's like cheating though. But if, if, if I want to be more fair to your question, I would like to try and travel to the 70s in the okay. US. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That would be fun. Yeah. That's where I would like to be. Give me the whole 70s and the 80s to be old. <laughs> but let me <laughs> give me my 20s and 30s in the 60s and 70s, or maybe 70s and 80s. And maybe let, let me get old in the 90s and 2000s, right? I think, I think that will be my choice voice actually it's been great talking to you is there anything else you'd like to talk about or any plugs oh shout outs thank you for the opportunity to have me on your show i think it's great it's a great conversation i think what you're doing is uh, very inspiring well thank you for joining really appreciate it Just look forward to keep watching your episodes and keep meeting new artists it's, it's super exciting thanks for having me kept me inspired i'm gonna keep doing it yes please do and again like if anybody wants a drink or food recipe just like uh write a comment um i'll try to make it and mention you and also uh, i think i mentioned the documentary about the border um uh just let Ann know and i'll be really happy to contact you and have you give you the access to the to the film yes so let us know in the comments below what sort of food or drink you want to see diego make and if there's anything you want to see on this show many thanks for watching and thank you diego you thanks for watching art in the raw if you've enjoyed this episode which i hope you have please like comment subscribe and as we mentioned, if you have any requests from Diego in terms of dishes or cocktails you'd like to see him make on Run This Dish, also drop those in the comments below. Thank you and have a good night. Mm -hmm.